Hello and welcome to another episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast with me, your host, Paul Swindell. Today I'm chatting with Jane Biggs from Bradwell, Norfolk, who is a mother, lifesaver and founder of the Heart to Heart Norfolk charity. So welcome, Jane. Morning, Paul. How are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Fine. This is my first podcast, actually, that I've done before. Good, good. I know you are a bit of a, a media uh, expert though because you've I've seen you on tv and in the newspapers quite a bit I wouldn't well I wouldn't say expert but yes I have done quite a bit <laughs> <laughs> I've done, I do quite a lot of tv and uh, radio um so but um I'm not sort of a an aim in homes <laughs> <laughs> although one thing I forgot to say in my intro is something that I saw recently and that was in a a paper in that you had been uh, nominated as one of Norfolk's most inspiring women, which is a very nice accolade, isn't it? Yes, one of um, Norfolk's top 100 most inspiring uh, women, which was lovely. Yes, yeah, so quite a few people nominated me for that, which was really nice. I didn't expect that. So um, that was lovely. Is, it, is that just a list or is there a, a prize or a, do they pick the top? Um, yeah, there is a competition. I think going to obviously list, I think it's the top 10. I don't know when that is, but there is. I think there is going to be some sort of competition for that. Well, fingers crossed for you for that, and uh, good luck. I would say you're in with a good chance. You've done some inspiring stuff, as we we will talk about. As I mentioned in your introduction, you're a mother lifesaver and the founder of a charity. And um, as I was saying before we we came on air, uh, I'd like to sort of break the conversation into two parts. One to talk about um, your personal experience with Violet's uh, event, and then talk about the uh, the charity a little bit later. Is that okay? Yes, that's absolutely fine. Um, if I understand it, and I've my research is right, I believe that Violet had her cardiac arrest back in February 2013. That's right. Yes, um, and she was seven years old at the time. Yeah, do you think you could tell me a little bit about your your life around that time and 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 the event? Yes, so obviously before Violet had her cardiac arrest, she'd never ever been poorly. Um, she ballroom dances and Latin at professional level. Um, she's reached Blackpool since, so she's really fit and active. Um, just a normal scenario. Nobody in the house smoked, lived a good lifestyle, um, and basically Violet was. Um, upstairs it was 23rd of February 2013 her sister Olivia had a friend sleeping and they'd just been messing about and then Liv uh, said to Violet oh you know we're now gonna sort of get on with our own things and Violet went into her room and it was about 11 o'clock at night and it was a Saturday and um I just heard her cough um literally that was all it was and she wasn't choking she wasn't nothing at the ordinary and I just thought do you know what I bet she's messing about to get back in the girl's bedroom so I, I went up and when I went into her bedroom she had totally stopped breathing she was on sitting up in the bed and she was literally taking there was no breath I knew that she was not going to breathe again she was literally falling um, because obviously she couldn't get her breath so um, I started CPR straight away um, obviously screamed for my husband and um didn't think for one minute she had a cardiac arrest I thought she was obviously choking on sick um so um I started as I say the CPR my husband then run up the stairs and took over from me while I dialed 999 um we put the phone on loudspeaker so obviously the um, paramedics counted us in um and we did that for seven minutes um that's when the paramedics got to our home um Violet was in full VF ventricular fibrillation so she obviously I thought she was blue. I thought she's not going to ever come around from this. Um, They started CPR again and they shocked her once with a defibrillator CPR for a further two minutes and she came back to us. So um, she then came back to us and I thought, oh my goodness, she's come back to us, but she's, I think she's brain damaged because obviously she was so delirious when they, she came round. So they rushed down the stairs with her within that seven minutes. We already had um, another ambulance turn up. There was four paramedics. Um, my poor mum come running in and obviously saw the paramedics come running out because in that time I obviously had rang my mum because I obviously I knew it was such a panic, but I'd still rang mum knowing that Olivia and her friend would be here on their own. 
Um, so we went to our local hospital, James Paget, and um, they then told us that Violet had had a sudden cardiac arrest, which obviously we just couldn't believe. Think, how could a healthy seven-year-old little girl go to bed and have a cardiac arrest? So we then were, um, they were going to airlift us to Great Ormond Street, but the helicopter was out. So they sort of were trying to obviously say to her, what's your name? Who are you? And obviously she was still really delirious. And then she was um, taken up obviously to um, recovery. She wasn't put in an induced coma or anything. And then at about two in o'clock in the morning, she's, she came round and obviously scared out of her life because she was in hospital, all wires connected. And um, she was perfectly normal. There was no delay in conversation. She was absolutely fine. Um, and then the next day, now that, that day actually, we were then transferred to Great Ormond Street Fire Ambulance with um, a doctor in the back and obviously paramedics. Um, then we spent nearly a month at Great Ormond Street where they diagnosed her with long QT syndrome. So obviously before then, we'd never heard of it. Um, and then obviously said that they needed to put an ICD in her, implantable cardio defibrillator. So I hadn't even didn't even know what one of those was. Obviously, I knew what a pacemaker was, didn't know what an ICD was. So it was absolutely life changing. And also in that the first week, um, Olivia was with us because they had to test Olivia as well. Um, so it was just unbelievable, like how your life changed in seconds from just being... And, you know, everything fine, as I say, a normal family. But um, And then that happening. So we know, obviously, we are so blessed that Violet survived because um, it's a miracle, really. And my friends say to me, oh, you know, why did you go up when she coughed? And I just think, do you know what? I don't even know why I went up when she coughed because she wasn't joking. But I just went up. And obviously, thank God I did, because it would have been the worst scenario that any parent could ever, ever imagine to find in the morning so obviously Violet um, then had her ICD implanted at Great Ormond Street um, she's had 35 genetics they still come back as all negative so even though they say it's long QT she hasn't got that genetic link yet um, and they still test her sister um, Olivia um, and um, ironically, it was only in May this year that um, even though they've tested Olivia for the past six years, that there was, um, they showed a blip on her ECG um, with her like QT waves. And they've actually now put Olivia, she's 19, on um, beta blockers. And then she's not at Great Ormond Street anymore because she's now 19. So she's discharged and she goes to Bart's. So they were sort of talking about um, having a reveal fitted, but she's had an MRI. So obviously we were absolutely devastated by that because uh, we always thought that everything, there was no sort of link or anything. And obviously Livia's at Southampton University doing a four year master's as an adult and pediatric nurse. So um, we just couldn't believe it. And she just, well, she rang me one night and said that she felt really poorly and that her heart was really racing. This was obviously very recent. And she dialed 111 and an ambulance come and got her. So that was really quite, you know, that was the holidays has been just could sort of getting our heads around that as well. Um, and then obviously Violet's obviously on a second ICD. So the first ICD that she had, um, unfortunately, had 40 leads so she had to have that removed. Um, and the second ICD that she's now got is, um, is unfortunately, um, they left the wire in from her first ICD. And that has now made um, one of her valves leak. So she's got to have, yeah. So she's now got to have, um, obviously nobody, and this is the first time I spoke about this, but in August, she had a 3D echo um, 90 minutes that confirmed that she's got to have the ICD taken out and she's got to have the lead removed and um, it's major operation. Um, so we're just waiting to hear back from Great Ormond Street at the moment when this is going to happen. Um, I've said I've actually, you know, if you are going to take that ICD out again, I don't really want um, another 
ICD going in with the leads. I'd rather have the subtaneous one, which just hasn't got any of the wires, because my worry is obviously <laughs> she's had two now, and she's had two that obviously, which is just pure bad luck, um, that the wires have played up. So that, when they took the first one out, they said to us that they had left the wire in because the first one took five hours to get out because she'd grown so much from seven to 12. So they said, we'll leave the wire in because if we don't, if we take it out now, it's open heart surgery. And as she's been in surgery for like five, six hours, we can leave the wire in and everything's okay. But obviously they've left it in and it's obviously caused this leak. So if they can't repair the valve, they've actually got to replace it. So um, at the moment, we're just waiting for that hideous, horrible call to find out when she's going to go in. So, um, yeah, so some has been a bit rubbish, really, regarding different things of what happened. But, um, you know, it's just one of those things. Well, there's, there's a lot you've said, an incredible amount there. And uh, ending with that bombshell must be uh devastating well not only for your family the whole story but this uh, latest episode for for violet as well how, how is she how is she and how has she been through all of this well obviously she knows obviously the valve's leaking um she doesn't know at the moment the extent of the operation because we're waiting to get that date with the consultants to obviously talk to her so um Obviously, it shocked um, Tony and I. We didn't realise the extent of the operation, to be honest with you, because obviously we thought, oh, well, they would just repair the lead, but we didn't realise they would have to take the living lead out of the heart. So, um, yeah, so, so she knows, obviously, um, it's got to be done. Um, and she's actually said to the consultant, you know, she's got a GCSEs to revise for and things like that. So she's really conscious of taking time off school because it's six weeks recovery time. Well, six weeks when you're 14 is a long time off school, isn't it? You know, so um, so I think, what's today? I think tomorrow, actually. It's tomorrow that the consultants and the cardiologists are all gathering to um, talk about her and decide mm -hmm. what the next step well, is. Fing fingers crossed. I mean, it's an incredibly... Uh, rare event i imagine for leads to cause this sort of problem for anyone else who's got an icd and leads don't want to unnecessarily worry you i mean no and it is it is it's just pure bad luck you know i mean some people have their icds 10 years and you know it's just one of those it's just one of those things you know so she got what happened was she got shocked appropriately um after it had been in about four and a half years and it was after she was shot that she then got like a build up of calcium on the wire, which they don't know why that even happened. Um, and then that's when that happened as well. But it's just because obviously they've left this lead in, which is the real mm -hmm. sort of the bad I do, thing. I do really. know that um, removing leads can be quite a tricky uh, scenario. So I think they they quite often do leave them yeah. in if 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 it's uh, perceived to be more dangerous to take it out. so Yeah, and that was the thing, you know, we understood that at the time. And, you know, you can leave them in and they are fine. But unfortunately, Violet's has moved. So um, we're just waiting now. Yes, um, fingers crossed for that. <laughs> um, how, how had Violet been uh, sort of, I mean, this is six years on now from her, or six and a half years on from the original arrest. I mean, how... You mentioned that she sort of was uh, delirious in hospital initially and then became quite coherent uh, a little while later. And how, how was she after that? Absolutely fine. Literally, there's never no brain damage or anything. Absolutely, you know. I like that. And the actual hospital and the paramedics said to us it was because Tony and I had done the CPR for the seven minutes without that obviously she wouldn't have made it anyway but obviously we kept her going for those full seven minutes um and obviously then she was shocked so she was so lucky so, it, so it, lucky. yeah i mean it's a it's a great example of uh recognizing the cardiac arrest almost immediately your your, your mother's instinct uh kicked in perhaps when you heard that cough that something wasn't quite right and uh then you get up there and you start the CPR straight away, and then when the uh, defib arrives, you you uh, 
you got the shocks pretty straight away. And uh, ha- had you any previous experience of CPR or had you done training at all? Only at work. You know, when I, my husband works in the offshore industry and I've worked in the offshore industry, it's only what you learn at work. But I mean, I'd learned it when it was mouth to mouth. I mean, now obviously they don't really teach it with mouth to mouth. Obviously you can do mouth to mouth, but obviously it's usually just obviously the compressions. So it was obviously, but I'd never done it on anybody and you don't ever expect to do it on your child. And everyone always says to me, oh, I can't believe how you did it and stayed so calm. And what shocked me as well was the amount of my friends that said, I wouldn't know what to do. And I thought, oh my God, that is diabolical. How can you not know what to do? How can you not know CPR? And even then before obviously, I obviously started Heart to Heart Norfolk. I just think, how can you not know CPR? It's a life skill. Everyone should mm-hmm, know. Absolutely. What to do. I mean, going going back to that though, um, they do actually talk you through it, don't they? When when you phone up nine nine nine, they do. And when when I obviously, because obviously I do the, the CPR and defib training, I always say to people, if you're ever in a situation where you dial nine nine nine, it's always put the phone on loudspeaker always put it on loudspeaker so they will talk you through it you know and it's just the the best thing you can do how did the actual event affect you as a as a a parent and as someone who sort of had to do cpr on their child and doing cpr on a child i believe is different to doing it on an adult anyway yeah do you know it's really weird i i am um I do just, I've always just got on with things in my life. You know, I can honestly say it's not even, it's not ever affected me. I think, and that is because Violet survived. I think it would be a purely different scenario if she hadn't have made it. Because Violet survived and then what happened, and even my husband says that as well, that hasn't affected us as parents because she's here. You know, she's here to to tell the tale. Um and that's just what we did, and that's what uh-huh. we just got on with. Well, that's that's great to hear that, because um, you do hear a lot about a lot of people who experience um, PTSD. Yeah, do you know what, Paul? I've never ever, it's never ever, I've never had a flashback from it. Never really think about it at all. And my husband's the same because you know, um, if we hadn't have done it, she would have died. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, it's great to hear that you had a great outcome and also you and your husband haven't been affected. What about your uh, other daughter and your daughter's friend? Because they were in the house at the same time, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, they obviously saw it as well. Well, actually, the girls' bedrooms were upstairs um, and they got the floor upstairs. So I then sort of tried to, like, I should have been shut the door so they couldn't see it. But obviously they heard everything heard the pandemonium um obviously see me start the cpr and obviously i was screaming i mean obviously i'm just talking about it now but it was absolutely horrendous you know obviously you're screaming for my life um we did we actually did do 999 um on bbc one close calls i hadn't ever done no publicity with violet ever um she didn't ever want any publicity didn't want anything so i'd never done anything and then when I um, set up Heart to Heart Norfolk, the paramedics contacted me who came out to her and said, um, we'd really like to meet her. And um, this was so obviously, well, th- three years on. And I said to Violet, you know, would you like to meet them? And she was like, oh, I don't really know. Um, but I, I said, oh, they said they'd come to the house. So they came to the house because we live right near the ambulance station anyway. Um and the depot, they came to the house and um, they said to us then, you know, it was just a miracle. They'd never, even at the hospital, they'd never, ever seen a child in cardiac arrest. Um, and usually when you're like in you're the ambulance, you don't ever radio each other. Um, but they radioed each other for someone to get here. And as it was, one of the ambulances was going to another job and they turned back and came to us instead. So, so she did have sort of everything on her side. So after we did that, there was a photograph taken that went in the East of England Ambulance magazine. And then the BBC contacted me and said, obviously, we've heard about Violet's story. We've played the 999 call. Would you do um, BBC, um, you know, 999 close calls? And I said, um, I'll speak to Violet about it. And I spoke to her and we only did it just basically just to promote that anyone of any age can have a sudden cardiac arrest. But I've never, ever watched it because 
I don't want to hear that 999 call because everyone said to me who watched it, oh my goodness, don't watch it. It's absolutely heartrending. And I, and there was not one person I know who didn't watch it, who didn't cry. So I just thought, oh, we'll do it. And obviously we did it, <laughs> but I didn't watch it. <laughs> well, I, I take my hat off to you for, for doing that and putting yourself through. Did they, in, oh, I have watched it, but I did try to uh, watch it again earlier, but it's not available anymore, is it? So No, it isn't, no. That's a shame, that no. is. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? I don't know why they do that, because it's been on twice. It's been repeated. Um but as I say, both times I haven't watched it. Because <laughs> it, it's probably got some good learning points in there for the general public. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know. Um, and you know what? The funny thing was, when we a, got back after Violet had her cardiac arrest and got home, um, there was, a, um, a, I don't think it was like 999 close calls, but there was another emergency program on. And we'd only been back a day. And, and on there was this girl of 15 who'd had a cardiac arrest and um, her parents had saved her and she had an ICD. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. We've been back home. And there's this story on, obviously, of another young girl having a cardiac arrest and having this. I just couldn't believe it, you know, because I thought to myself, well, before this happened to Violet, I'd never even heard about it. Never about heard about a child having a cardiac arrest. Yeah, they're more, they're more common than you think. Well, I'm sure you probably know, don't you? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they really are. And I th- it's incredibly sad for anyone to have one, but a child in particular. At, uh, uh, how is she about that? Is she? Is, has it sort of sunk in with her? Has it affected her in, uh, in how she is and what she does? Um, no, I mean, in July, she went to Switzerland for 10 days with scouts. Um, obviously, I didn't go with her. Um, they had a 36 hour delay at the airport but <laughs> because of the thunder and lightning that that was that awful day so yeah so and she did um I mean she did loads at scouts went in the thermal pools um tobogganing you, you know you name it she did it um she you know she'd been abroad before she just went to the security and said oh I've got ICD um she's very grown up I think the sad thing is when something like that happens to a child, I really feel that children lose their childhood because they have to grow up overnight. And that is the real, that is, the, I think that's the saddest part out of all of it, to be honest with you, that, you know, they have something so horrendous like that happen um, and they have to grow up so quickly. So even though for, Violet's 14, she's so grown up, you know, you'd never think that she is 14, to be honest with you. Uh-huh. I mean, but it doesn't sound like she it's stopping her enjoying her childhood by doing all of these things. And I, I remember si- oh, gosh, no. seeing a uh, picture of her on a, on a roller coaster in Florida some some years ago. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and she's so sensible. So uh, as well, which I'm really like both girls are sensible. So obviously she's in the netball team. So she's got a protective vest that um, that she wears. Um, she knows, you know what she can't and can't do but to be honest with you there's not a lot that she can't do there really isn't yeah I think there's a lot of uh fear and myths about what you can and can't do and a lot of people sort of uh, want to curl up and just protect themselves but you can do a lot can't you it's that to the day life goes on and she is still a child isn't she she's still got a long life ahead of her you know so um I mean like I was so thrilled that she wanted to go to Switzerland that was just brilliant you know that she even wanted to go because um you know I thought I wonder if she will go I wonder if she will go she's obviously been to hiking holidays and or everything with scouts in the UK but not Switzerland um and the thing is as well that the, the scout group have no qualms about taking her which is fabulous because I know that obviously I know other parents and I've got children with ICDs whose schools are like, oh, you know, can't really let them do them on that because of this, blah, blah. Well, God, I would not have that in a million years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because why? I, I, what I, my argument is, Violet is more protect, protected than any other child or anybody else on any trip because she has got her ICD. If anything happens to anybody else, they have got to rely on a defibrillator. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Yeah, so it's great that she's uh, continued to, to live the life um, as she was before, and she's still doing her dancing. You mentioned she was quite a good dancer. She, what, she, uh, she She's really good. She's reached Blackpool, but she's actually only just given it up, and that is due to the fact that 
She's now 14. It's on a Saturday in the afternoon, in the middle of the afternoon, and it just messes with her social life. <laughs> <laughs> she can't go, can't go to town or get on the bus with her yeah. friends. <laughs> Lots of things change when so, they're teenagers, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? You know, I mean, obviously, she's still really um, – well, she's not a scout now. She's just gone up to Explorers last night, actually. So she's now an Explorer. So – and both girls have done Beavers Cubs – scouts olivia's done a young leader she's now an adult leader so i they want i know that she'll never give that up which Mm -hmm. is great which is obviously on a tuesday evening so it's so much better great okay so we're sort of uh have you got anything else that you'd like to add about um about violet and your 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 experience of being a mother of a cardiac arrest uh child and if if you've got any advice or anything like that for others who may be going through similar experience um well it's i have, what i found hard was um well not hard it's like when it when it happens obviously you always sort of think to yourself oh this time last year this was this was like this blah blah and then when i when we got like past the year i just it just was like oh well i just felt a lot better after it got past the year it's a bit of a funny feeling really because you do sort of still compare things you know you think oh this time last year you know, we did. There was no worry or anything. No, you know, or anything to worry about. But to be honest with you, um, you know, if you've got a child that has survived a sudden cardiac arrest with no brain damage, you know, and they are having an ICD, I just feel you've got to feel totally blessed that they're here. That's how I feel personally. You mentioned the the anniversary. Did you celebrate it at all? No, never. No, Violet's so literally. I've always said to her, "Do you know what? I don't even would, wouldn't even think she'd know it was the twenty third of February. She might do, but um, I know some people sort of celebrate it, don't they? Like with cakes and things and that. But Violet's really um, private, and I think she's fourteen as well. Um, I'm not saying that she's different, but she just wants to be like everybody else. She doesn't want to feel that she's celebrating something that happened. That's how Vi is. So, yeah. So we don't. I don't. I don't. Last year, I don't even think I mentioned no, it. That's to her. Gra- well, well, that's <laughs> great. If she, if it's not bothering her, and she's just leading a, a life as as it would have been, that, that that's the best outcome you could expect, really, or hope for. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, she does everything. She goes, you know, concerts at the O2, and yeah, she does loads of things. She, you know, I'm just trying to think what she doesn't do, really. And what about um, you? You you sound like you're totally okay with it. Are you? Do you stress and worry when she goes off on these trips to Switzerland and things like that? No, <laughs> no, because she's got her ICD. If she didn't have an ICD, I would probably think, oh, I would be worried. But I don't worry because that's what it's there for. It's a guardian angel on her shoulder, and like what I just said, she's more protected than anybody else. And that's how I think uh-huh. about it. Well, that's a great way to think about it. It's really positive. Um, that's great. Okay, so moving on to the second half of the, the conversation, which was about your charity, Heart to Heart Norfolk. Um, the cardiac arrest, uh, or Violet's cardiac arrest was in 2013. And then I believe you started the charity in 2016. Is that right? That's so, right, so what yes. was what was the yes. the spark so, that uh, made you start doing something? Well, I, I basically where we live. So I live in Bradwell, which is obviously only about three four miles from Great Yarmouth. So obviously a big seaside town. Um, and there's Lowestoft, um, and basically Great Yarmouth, Lowestoft, Galston. All those places, not one of them had a public defibrillator. Is it? Not did one. you did did so you go actively great... looking, or was it just something that sort of? I just, I just, I just, yeah. Obviously, because I knew because I've lived here, and then I, I looked, and I just obviously looked on the East of England ambulance map, and I just was astounded to think that we didn't have one anywhere. So um, I thought to myself, oh, I'll raise a little bit of money, try and put some in the community. Um, and see how I how I get on um and obviously I started to raise the money and um just the support was colossal because obviously there was other people that then re- knew and realized how lacking we were on public defibrillators where we live um so I hadn't gone about to set up a charity obviously at all because obviously I didn't have a name or anything I was just doing it 
by myself. And then obviously then with such the support, so did, did, I um, you, The aim was just to get one, was it, to put in your local village? Yeah, basically, yes. That was it, really, just sort of... How did you go about raising that money in the first instance? Just by, like, doing... Um, I put out, like, I was going to do sort of Tom Bowlers and raffles, um, raise some money. Um, would any counsellors be prepared to donate and things like that? So, obviously, I got the money really quickly. Um, and then How much I, did you raise? So, 1500 so I got that really quickly. And um, and then after that, I had so many people say, you know, would really support you, really, um, it's really great what you're doing. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll set up a charity, like, um, you know, not, not a registered charity. So I set up like Heart to Heart Norfolk. And then um, one, I don't know if you know the situation, but once you get to £5,000 with fundraising, you can then um, apply for registered charity status so um i then obviously applied for that that took eight months so i reason i did that was because you're then vat exempt on medical equipment which is obviously a massive saving um so i then obviously set up heart to heart norfolk and um 2017 i was the mayor's charity of the year um on the mayor's charity of the year for great yarmouth again this year um i then went to obviously parish council meetings councillors basically wherever i could go i would go and um talk um and just the support was just immense i had like businesses coming forward donating money to me um because obviously you get you're so much more um you get a lot more money donated if you're a registered charity, like the Masonic Lodge will only donate if you're a registered charity. So many places will not donate unless you are a registered charity status. So once I got that registered charity status, and obviously then everyone could see what I was doing, where I was in the community and how you, the work said, was going. You said it took um, uh, eight months to get registered charity status. How, how come it took so long? Is that just they're, they're slow? <laughs> yeah, and because so many people are fraudulent. So there's so many people who are fraud, who are trying to open a charity as a fraudulent. They literally had a backlog. That's how long it took. They pro- even though I applied, they probably didn't even pick up my paperwork till six months on. That's how overworked they are, and how they are obviously still trying to stop people who were doing it as a, a fake. And that, how difficult was it for you to set up your charity? in terms of you know the the mechanics of it getting people to support you not financially but to to back your aims well uh, so obviously you've got three you have to have trustees once you're registered charity so um i've got three trustees um all the local councillors here were literally totally on board um you know i'd write to them and say you know what money have you got in your budget can you fund so and so and literally they would just fund it because they then thought you know, my, my God, there isn't no public defibs anywhere here. So um, in two years, so just over two years, I've placed um, over 140 public defibrators. Wow, that's, that's some going. <laughs> I've got um, a defib in every single school um, where we are. So from, I would say, over 30 schools, I've got public defibs. High schools, I promote that they have two, that they have one inside and they have one outside as a public one and one inside because high schools are too big just to have one defib. Um, But I'm just passionate that they are available 24-7. So on all the little village schools like Winston, Rollsby, Philby, all the little schools, they're all outside the school. The heads leave the gate open, the little side gates open, so they're open 24-7 and the other ones are on the front Um, because that is what I'm really passionate about, that they are not locked away. Uh Well, absolutely. I mean, that is is key, isn't it, really, especially in a a small village maybe if you've got a village school and they've got the defib there. They may be the only defib in the village, so... And they are on most of them. I'm like in Winterton, the one I've put outside the school there, that is the only defib in the whole of that village. Um, so, you know, and the school's shut for six weeks, holiday, Christmas. And I think there's nothing worse. Um, I mean, so many shops, so many shops have got them locked away. No one knows that they're in there. Um, you know, so why don't they have them outside? It's just craziness. It is. And I and, uh, don't know if you know, a lot of dentists uh, have them as well. And quite often they're... Yeah, and all the, and all the doctors. Yeah, and they're, they're just stuck in the cupboard around the back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, 
Marks and Spencers as well. That theirs is all all behind customer services. There's no sign actually on the window that they've got a a defib inside, so nobody would know that all Marks and Spencers have got a defib. Mm-hmm. So it's just craziness. It really is. Yeah. But anyway, I just um, did a quick calculation, and I don't know if you've done the calculation before, but you said you put 140 defibs in uh, across. You say is it Norfolk and I seem to remember Norfolk and, and Suffolk, Suffolk now actually. Okay, so you're, you're yeah. spreading out. Um, you're going to come down into Essex as well. <laughs> actually, someone's just um, bought one off me. They are um, last week for South End. Is that Charlie? Yeah, I, I was <laughs> yeah. speaking to her yesterday. <laughs> she mentioned that. I yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've um, helped up someone. Uh, got one in the Isle of Wight. Believe it or not. Um, so basically, you know, if people come to me and they, you know, want help or, you know, it doesn't matter that obviously I know I'm heart to heart Norfolk because obviously I didn't expect to be so, I'd say popular, but so obviously overwhelmed with the support I've had. So, um, I mean, I put as many in Suffolk now as I do in Norfolk, to be honest with you. I mean, last year was the, obviously amazing that one of the public defibs I put out did save somebody's life. So Richard was sailing um, at Galston. Um, he's 52, his son's nine, um, fit as a fiddle, obviously sails all the time. And he lives in Norwich, which is obviously about 50 minute drive away. He was just about to get in his car to go home and he literally fell 10 feet from the public defibrillator that I'd put outside this hotel. Um, and about three months previously, I'd been into the sailing club and just run through CPR and the defib with them and all his crew were there and they got him back on the second shock before the paramedics even got there. So Obviously, I always say it's a funny thing is it's it's something that you put out that you don't want to be used. But obviously, when that was used to save Richard's life, it was just amazing. And he's been so on board since he's literally um, he's done parachute jumps. Um, well, he's, he's chaps, his people who, who work for him, he's got a heating, en- um, heating firm in Norwich. He's just done a 50 mile bike ride. Um, and then in, on May the 11th, I opened a charity shop in Galston, not something else I'd planned to do. Before we talk um, about that, could I just go back a, a little bit about Richard? Have you, you Presumably you've met him, have you? Yes, that's what I was yeah. So obviously, so he's just put all the heating system in the shop as well. So we, so we, so we had a bit of a joke and I said to him, oh, I couldn't, couldn't have saved a better met person, really, Richard. And he was really laughing. I said, I'll have to put a note, you can only be saved if you're a tradesman. And he was like, we had a real joke. Yeah, so I've met Richard loads of times. Um been, and then when it was his six year, um, six month anniversary of his save, um, he did a really lovely meal at his house that me and Tony were invited to, and obviously the people who saved him. And he just said, obviously, that was really emotional. To be honest, um, was, you know, he was just. I was going to say, how, you know, how does it feel to save uh, not just your daughter's life, but someone else's life? I, you know, it was just, it was so emotional, you know, because obviously the, the, the chaps were there. Because obviously if they hadn't done the CPR, you know, it, it's not just the matter, as you well know, of using that defib. You know, if they hadn't been in, you know, done the CPR and obviously they said, you know, well, Jane had been in about, you know, three months beforehand. And he just said, you know, if I wasn't for the defib there, I wouldn't be here today. So, um, yeah, that was really emotional. And yeah, just such a really nice chap, you know, and you just think, it ne- and yet again, he'd never been ill, you know, and it's just pure fate, I believe in fate, that he fell literally 10 feet from the cabinet and he was then about to drive the 50-minute journey home. If he'd have been in the car, he would obviously would have died. Absolutely, yes. And the, as you know? I've, I've come across a few stories just recently about uh, people who've had a cardiac arrest right by a defibrillator, defibrillator and uh, I'm guessing that's uh, good in that it's showing that there are more of them out there. Um, so people are having them there, but one, one of them, actually the guy, he, it was um, a story on our blog, actually, um, he collapsed by it, but they didn't actually use it. Um, they, it was only when the ambulance turned up and they used their one. So it was a bit of a shame, but so sometimes there needs to be a little bit of a uh, education as well. Doesn't there about using them, not to be scared about using them. Yes, totally. I mean, I go into schools and teach the CPR and um, defibrillator, but my really is the main thing is is that obviously I go in from your sort of children from age five to sort of 16 but if if the children obviously weren't strong enough to do the cpr at least i educate them to know that those yellow boxes or sometimes green boxes out in that community 
what they are, what's inside there. If you dial 999, that is how you get them out. So even if they weren't strong enough to do the CPR, they would be in a position to dial 999 and get that deep of a run to that person with it. So obviously I educate them that in as well because you would not believe how many children and how many adults, to be honest with you, don't even realise how you access them and what's the situation mm-hmm. with them. And do you provide the uh, CPR training as well? I do. And how's that going? Yeah, really well. Um, um, I have a, a heart failure cardiac nurse, um, Mickey Cox at James Paget Hospital, who is an advanced life support trainer as well, who does everything for me for free. Well, obviously, we do it together. Um, we do sessions at the hospital, you know, PowerPoint videos, um, really promote everyone has a go. Um yeah, I've got a big session tomorrow night actually at a village hall. So yeah, they they're really popular. Um, I haven't done as much as I usually do because obviously of the shop, but um, that's why I do sort of you know the community ones now because it just works uh-huh. out better. How's the shop going? Um, really well, um, so well that I'm actually just opening a third room because the amount of donations and the support I have is unbelievable. So I'm the only charity shop on the road as well. There's not one charity shop on this road and it's um, a really lovely sort of old fashioned road that um, sort of next door, we've got an old fashioned barbers and then next door to me, I've got home brewery shop that, you know, beers and wine. And then opposite there's like a dog grooming and there's like a 1970s um, cafe. So it's a really lovely road. And obviously I'm the only charity shop on there, which is an absolute bonus, and you can park. Um, but the support and donations I have, I at one point I had to say no more donations because I've got over a hundred foot of storage, three rooms upstairs, and I'm not kidding you, I, I, you can't move. I've got enough there, I think, till about twenty thirty. <laughs> I hope I hope you've got a mountain of, uh, or uh, not a mountain, a, a whole load of helpers to uh, help you get through that. Because I can imagine s- sorting that stuff is a uh, is a big task. Oh well, usually we have to go in on a Sunday, or um, I'm not open on a Monday or a Wednesday because the shops, believe it or not, this is how what an old fashioned road it is. All the shops still shut on a Wednesday down there, so you don't you sort of hear that anymore. But um, yeah, everyone shuts on a Wednesday, so. Um, I try and sort it out as it comes in, but yesterday I just couldn't even cope with it, the amount of stuff that come in. Sometimes cars pull up and they're like pulling up and I'm thinking, don't open your boot, don't open your boot. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then the boot opens and I think, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like that yesterday, this this car pulled up and I could see it all bound up and I thought, oh no, you're now coming in. Um but that's but just do you know what it Paul? It just goes to show how wasteful we are. Because honestly, the amount of stuff that I get that's is new with tags on. Nearly all of it. I mean, the bedding and curtains and things that was gonna go in the third room, half of it's new in packets. So it's really it's bad really, and it to show how wasteful we are huh. and what we buy we don't need. Well, it's it's good that we've got um organizations like yourself that can make use of this and turn it into something good. In two ways. Cause- well, also, as, yeah. And also, as well, I'm really, really cheap. So everyone says to me, well, the first thing when they come in, they go, oh, it smells so lovely in here. <laughs> That's the first thing they say. And then obviously they say, oh, my goodness, you're so cheap. Because all my tops, whatever make, are from Ted Baker, Wallace, Next, or anything, are all like pound, two pound. Um, everything is so reasonable. Because at the end of the day, it's donated. I'm 100% non profitable. So there's no staff being paid. My friend actually bought the shop with her pension fund to me to open it as a charity That's shop. That's very kind. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, the tills were donated, the rails were donated, um, the carpet was all donated and fitted for free. My husband decorated it all beautifully. As I say, Richard put all the heating in, central heating. Um, so, you know, I didn't even struggle to fit it out. It was just... Um, as I say, the third room's now opening because I've got two rooms because I've got so much stuff. Um, so my husband's there every night this week painting because the carpet's being laid Friday. Um, so yeah, it's just yeah, it's just just really gone brilliantly, and it's because as well because because I'm local and the money is staying where we live. So because obviously people who are local they see where I put all the defibs out 
Um, and obviously that's why the support that I have. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, from going back from what you said, you said you put 140 uh, defibs and you, if we guess uh, or estimate that they cost 1500 each, that do you realize that's over 200 K that you've raised? And I'm, I imagine that your shop's only going to increase your uh, funds. So how many defibs are you aiming for? Or have you got a target? So I don't know. I mean, it is, um, it's quite um, nice, you know, like I had a local football club contact me a couple of weeks ago that were like really struggling to get a defib and they had like really done his research and said, you know, there wasn't a, a public defib within a six mile radius. Um, you know, they were all first aid trained and everything, and it, you know, and it, so what happened was I was on the telly again <laughs> and, I, and um, from being on the telly within five minutes of me coming off air, I had two businesses who obviously just like looked for me on, on online who then contacted me and said, can we buy two public defibs for our businesses? This was two separate ones. And then obviously then people then contact me saying, oh, we're really struggling. And it's lovely that then I'm in a position to say, um, well, yes, I can fund you one. And they're like, oh my goodness, are you joking? Um, I mean, the other thing as well, Paul, I've never, ever paid for one to be installed, ever. If somebody charges to fit a public defibrillator, that's bad <laughs> karma in my eyes. So um, an electrician will always fit them for free. I've, I've never paid for one, and I don't ever intend tend to pay for one to be fitted. So um, you don't have to be a certified electrician. If it's going on a pub, obviously if it's a, obviously a business or a school, there's like regs and things. But like I drop them off at pubs, and within half an hour the landlord's uh-huh. fitted them. So, you know, so that is a real thing. You know, if anyone is ever raising money for one, please do not pay anyone to install them because somebody will always install it for free. And, and is that 1500 including the case and everything? So it's uh, all weather tight and what have you? Yeah, stainless steel. Um, it's the Cardiac Science G5 defibrillator, which is what the ambulance service endorse. Um, and the, the, the best thing about it is it counts the CPR beat. So once you lift the lid and you put those pads on, it, it literally, obviously, if you need to shock, it will tell you, but it counts the 30 chest compressions and it tells you to give two breaths. And also on the screen, it also, it, you can see all that visibly as well, what it says. It is... Um, it is a fabulous defibrillator. It really is. You just said you were on TV. Was that about the uh, the organised gangs stealing defibs? Because I saw an article about that. Well, I don't think it is gangs to myself. I mean, there was two stolen in Newmarket. Um, and that's what I said on my interview. I honestly don't believe a gang would be doing that. It would just be a chance as you'd think, oh, I'll get some money for those. But as you know, someone who is buying a defib legitimately will not buy a secondhand one because obviously all the serial numbers are registered. So I just obviously think it was someone who was just going out to get it. I can't honestly see a gang going to nick defibs. I really can't because they're not going to even get no scrap for them. Um you know, and nine times out of ten, most people who nick them don't even know what they're for. Quite likely, yes. So, you know, I mean, if you go online, um, it's very rare you would see a second heat defib on there, but straight away, unless it's new in the box or something and hasn't been used, you might think a bit differently. I mean, I've had about eight donated to me so so sometimes people upgrade their defibs a bit like your mobile phone you know you, you go up you upgrade your phone they up they sort of get the next version of the defibs so I've had some donated to me but um but I wouldn't ever think oh, I'll put them online you know and see if someone wants to buy them like that obviously I then buy new pads and batteries and put them out so it is it's not very if you see one online you can usually guarantee it's been stolen <laughs> you know because why would you be selling one um yeah what is the run you said about buying new pads and uh, stuff? Um, what's the sort of running costs uh, for these sort of devices? Um, so the battery lasts four years. Um, so a new battery costs, um, I get them for 190 And new pads last two years. Um, I get two sets of pads as well. So a new set of pads is between 25 and £30. Pounds. So it's a couple of hundred pounds every couple of years? Yeah, well, every well, I suppose for every four years the battery. So yes, yeah, so you need two sets of pads. So every two years it's fifty pound. So what I do, like with the pubs and places like that, I um they just have a collection pot on the bar, 
and then what's ever in there by the time we empty it it just pays yeah, that's for a it good all, idea. which is the best thing to do yeah because obviously then there's no outlay is there you know so they that's what we do with it. that's what i just do with the pubs i say have a collection pot and what's ever in it you just use that money to then we'll use it to buy the pads and battery when we need to you said about um, when you get uh, people wouldn't um, buy them online because they they got serial numbers and you register them. Whereabouts do you register them? Um, with the ambulance service and also you'll register it with like cardiac science. So you register it with those as well. And they obviously with the serial number and where it's from. So basically you've got two sort of proofs where that defibrillator has come from. So if someone then went to even buy pads or batteries from somewhere else, um, you know, it's – or you know try to sell it again it there would be a, there'd be a link to it somewhere you know where it's been and where it was from uh-huh. put it that way so do, do you have a uh, a website or anything like that that people can perhaps contact you on or uh, see where all your defibs are well i'm having a website built at the moment actually which is going to have a live map on it so that will show where all the um public defibs are um but obviously if you go on the east of england ambulance site um map there is a full list there going from or well, right from essex cambridge all over basically and well, hempstead from great yarmouth so there's a full list on there obviously there's the good sam's app as well now which is the new app that um well it's not new but it's new here so it was rolled out i think in london first where you obviously take a picture of the defib and put where you are the location and you can register on the good sounds Act, which means then if um sort of a paramedic or a healthcare professionals out that will come up it will bleep them that if there is a an incident where the nearest defib is um so that you know i i, I really think you know if you do steal them you just you're not going to get anywhere if I'm no. honest with you <laughs> hopefully not anyway um, just a, another point on that that uh, defib map. There is a uh, is a good list of defib maps on the the Southern Cardiac Arrest UK website, and I don't know if you. Oh, is that right? Yep. There's a because there's lots of um, private ones. There's a couple of sort of public type ones on the the website. I don't I don't have a list of the defibs. I just got a list of the people listing them. And uh, oh, okay. And there's I don't know if you know there's a but you probably, I'm sure you do. There's a a national registry uh, going to be coming out in the in the near yes, future. Yes, next year. So it should be really handy. Indeed, indeed. Hopefully they make it yeah. publicly available because I did read that it was going to be for the ambulance services benefit, but I think that would be a little bit short-sighted if it was only for their benefit. So Yeah, I mean, it's just the trouble, you see. There's so many different webs and sites and so many different apps. I think people don't know where to go, do they? No, it does need to be consolidated and made publicly Definitely. available. Because yeah, people are interested. Once, once they... Once it's affected their life or they've um, seen someone they know affected by it, they, they take up an interest in it, as most of us have. I, I didn't really know about it before, unless you said you didn't really know about it before it happened no, to, to you Violet. No, you don't, do you? You don't. So, no. And it is you don't. literally the matter of, a matter of life and death, and it can be changed by just having this, this simple device, uh, which isn't that expensive in the scheme of things, Um just having these and around in public places. I mean, nearly every weekend. I know. Well, nearly every every week, because obviously I li- I live as I said. I only live five minutes from the ambulance depot. But ironically, um, uh, there's always. I mean, the other weekend I had five defibs that were there to be that that had been taken out just that weekend. They weren't used, but they were there. They were told to go and get them. You know. So that was just on that Saturday mm-hmm. all over. There was five taken out of different boxes. And that just goes to show how they it was. They do say now, don't they? You know, have you got a defibrillator? But you never guess what happened last week. I was driving to the shop and I saw a lady at a, at a pub and I thought, oh, she's checking the cabinet. And then I looked and she had a bit of paper in her hand and she was opening it and she undone the cabinet and ran off with the defib. And I thought, oh, my goodness, she's actually getting the defib out to run off in an emergency do you know what paul that really took my breath away i just you know like seeing it happen uh-huh. i couldn't believe it it was only like half nine in the morning and i thought oh my goodness i can't believe i've just seen a lady actually run off with the defib out of one of my cabinets so did you follow her so i turned round actually to see if she needed a lift and she'd lift because I, I, she was I, I was like the car was going one way and she run the other and it was like um, a little sort of 
the road. So I swung round, but she'd already gone. Um, but then the ambulance was already there. Uh-huh. Oh, well, that's good. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, that was quite um, – I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I was just – it took back yeah i'm sure it did yeah well it, it's uh and that, that was one of your tea fibs was it yes it yeah. was yes well well yeah. done to you anyway for uh, another potential customer <laughs> hopefully <you don't>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if that's what we can call oh, them <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> well it's been a really interesting talking to you and uh, really inspiring in, in in what you've been doing and uh, it's great to hear that uh, Violet and yourself and your family haven't really been too badly affected, but I hope um, what Violet's hope going to be going through soon. I uh, hope that is uh, yes. that goes smoothly for for her and for you as a family because it's going to be a testing time, I imagine. Yes, yeah, yeah. I am obviously very worried about that, as you can imagine. Um, but um, like what we always say, we'll get through it. We always mm-hmm. do. A positive look on life that's great so just to finish off have you got any tips for people who want to try and put um ads in their community not necessarily who who are in your area but uh, other parts of the country um oh definitely so basically look where you live um try and find out if there are any public defibrators anywhere where you are if there isn't um first port of call is wrote right to your local councillor um i funded nine by writing to local councillors um they've all got money to spend they've all got money in a pot that has to be used in the local community um right to the lions club right to the rotary clubs there's so many places that you can write to regarding even before you start doing sort of your fundraising um and as i say if you haven't got a defib in your village or where you live you know if if no one will help you then it's a bit of a poor show and you will find usually if you start fundraising where there isn't one people are really usually on board straight away Uh and the other thing i would say is as well if if you haven't learned cpr and you don't know cpr is obviously to go along somewhere and to make sure that you do learn it i mean obviously next year 2020 cpr is going to be on the national curriculum um about time um which obviously is needed um and also as well not the, not to be worried about using the defib you know in 2015 the law changed it's classed as the good samaritans act you cannot be used for using a defibrillator if you break somebody's ribs you know if they don't survive you've given it a go and what i always say is it's better to do something than do exactly. nothing exactly and, and uh, using a defibrillator or putting a defibrillator or the pads on someone's and it's not going to hurt them it's not going to shock them if they don't need it Exactly. So if your heart is not in a shockable rhythm, the defibrillator will tell you that and it will tell you to carry on CPR. So the prime example was Richard. So when Richard fell by the cabinet, he had a heart attack. So the defib, obviously, he wasn't in a shockable rhythm and it told him to carry on the CPR. After the two minutes, Richard went into cardiac arrest. The defib obviously picked that up and obviously told them that he needed to be shocked. So, you know, I always say to people when I do the training, don't worry that you're going to put the pads on somebody and you're going to start shocking them if they don't need it. If they don't need to be shocked, they will not be shocked. It just will not happen. I always say the the, the what is a real like when you watch all these um, casualty programs and hospital programs and it always says, oh, they are flatlined preparing to shock. And I always say that would never happen. If someone was flatlined, they would not be shockable. But they obviously always do that, don't they, on these TV exactly. programs. So, you know, unless your heart is in a shockable rhythm, I always say um, the, a cardiac arrest, your heart is like a bit of jelly, basically. It's still wobbling. So for that to, for that heart to get back into that rhythm, to get that jelly back into that shockable rhythm, that the only way you're going to go is with that defibrator. So, um, you know, there isn't no you know cause to worry you know as i say it's better to do something than do absolutely nothing. and what a great thing to finish on there so i say thank you very much for your time it's been as i said uh, really inspiring with uh, what you've been doing and uh, i hope violet um is go go everything goes okay for in the f- near future so thank thanks you. a lot and speak to you soon bye bye thank you